third lectures about uh, the non-invertible symmetries by Sakura. Great, thank you. Okay, is this on? Yes? yes. All right. Great, so let's start with a recap of last lecture. And the main gist of it was we wanted to go back to the problem of studying the symmetries in two dimensions. And we started with something very trivial in the sense that we just have a zero form, so global symmetry in two dimensions. Nothing fancy, it's completely invertible. It has essentially topological lines labeled by elements of a group. Let's take G to be finite. So here G is finite. But it doesn't have to be abelian, crucially. And it fuses according to the group law. D1G, D1H is D1GH. And then we said, let's gauge this zero form symmetry. And one way of doing that was to actually take the following perspective. And this is, I'm only repeating this perspective because this is the one that we'll use also in higher dimensions. So we take the two dimensional theory and we take a product with a one dimensional topological theory. And this one dimensional topological theory has the same G zero, so there's the same group G appearing here, symmetry. What that meant is, a one-dimensional topological theory has a bunch of vacua, and now there's a group acting on these vacua. So the group acting on the vacua will basically furnish some representation of this group. It will decompose the vacua into some irreps. And we're just taking the product of these two, and then gauge this diagonal, G. And the point was, once we gauge this, this product ceases to be a product. It becomes actually now sort of a topological defect. This is this 1 dt q of t becomes now a defect in this theory. And this is now, as before, labeled by representations. And so of, of the group G. And so now if you're asking what actually is the fusion on these guys, well, this just descends from how these 1 dt q of t is used. These were just representations. And so they will fuse according to one of these defects with representation R1, or representation R2, will be a sum over some integer coefficients here times D1, R3. And just to be very, very clear, these coefficients here are nothing other than the things that you do in your group theory lectures, right? You decompose the reps R1, R2. This is now here the tensor product of representations. And you have a klebsch gordon decomposition into irreps R3, say, with some coefficients and multiplicities. And you know very well that this is usually not just one term, but it's a bunch of irreps. And so in this sense, the, the symmetry, after we've gauged for at least a non-abelian symmetry, in group G, becomes non-invertible. Right? I did this example when G was abelian, then essentially everything is characters and this actually turns out to be a group again. But if G is non-abelian, this object, which I called rep G, is just a representation of G, um, is a non-invertible uh, symmetry in two dimensions. And it's this sort of thing that will now generalize to higher dimensions, where these kind of non-invertible structures are not that well understood yet, and it gives us a nice systematic way of constructing such non-invertibles. Are there any questions about this so far? This is just sort of the recap from last week. Uh, not last week, yeah, last lecture. <laughs> it's been a long week, <laughs> some time dilation in my head. Anyway, okay, so let's regeneralize this. to uh, higher dimensions. And it, the idea will always be, you start with a theory, you take a product uh, with a TQFT. So this theory has some group G0 acting. <laughs> you can still hear me? Something is not right here. Okay, so this is a TQFT with G symmetry. And I'll explain what this is in concrete detail in, in 
in, in three dimensions. And <clears throat> then what we're doing is we're gauging G, and then this becomes, maybe I should keep this. Uh, so this is a TQP. In fact, I want it to be a, a dimension V minus 1. And this becomes a DD minus 1 a defect. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so once we are in higher dimensions, uh, while the TQFT that we take the product with uh, should have dimension D minus one. Uh, and it doesn't not have any to other. be. It can also be of different dimension. Okay. Then you will con construct different types of defects. Here, I will start with a zero form symmetry. And I'm saying, OK, I would like to actually construct, so to speak, the defects that are actually now the analogs of these lines, uh, like the dual symmetry, so to speak. And so this is basically then a D minus one topological defect. I want to know what are actually uh, these types of defects. But indeed, in the, in the paper, and I now try to actually spell my collaborator's last name correctly. This is the correct spelling. I'm pretty sure. Um, and so in this paper, you'll see lots of different things. You can gauge even, you can even have GP, P-form symmetries, or higher group symmetries. And then you have that defects of different dimensionality that you can construct in this way. Just, just to make sure I understand. So even keeping the zero form symmetry, can we reduce the dimension of the TQFT? Uh, so you could in principle also, for example, in a two, I will do actually the case of a 3D theory, so 3DT, and I could also take a, the set of topological lines and try to construct the rep. And I'll get some lines. And in fact, indeed, I do have these rep G lines in the gauged theory. They are also there. I will get to them in, in a moment, actually. So in fact, this is sort of the abstract thing. And these things, just to, this is the notation. These will call theta defects for the reasons I explained yesterday. Sorry? That's like a theta angle. Yes? Uh, are you assuming that G is a non-anomalous in the TQFT? Uh, yes, so absolutely. And can I take like an anomalous uh, simmer in the TQFT? And in this case, I, I get like a defect attached to, the, to an IAT Ah, right, so yes, I guess you could, yes, something, some sort of a non-genuine type thing, yes, That's I'm it. sure. So I think this is literally just the simplest way to implement this sort of construction, but as I said also yesterday, you can now uh, go wild with this. You can do all kinds of things, even non-topological defects you could construct in this way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get now to the, the three-dimensional. So T, T is a 3D theory with a, a G0. So G0 is generated basically by some topological surfaces, but anyway, this is not important. So now actually what I would like to do is, in this three-dimensional theory, and this is the theory, it has this G acting on it. I now take a product with a 2D TQFT that has, that has G0 symmetry. And so, and then proceed in the same way. So the first question I need to answer is actually what are such 2D TQFTs with G symmetry? And then what is their fusion? And then this will tell us the theta defects and the fusion in the theory T mod G. All right, that's sort of the logical progression. And so that's what we'll discuss now, and actually um, theory uh, will give us a f the first example of a, of a nice uh, such structure. So these TQFTs are also known as GSPT phases. SPT for symmetry, protected symmetry. Topological phases. 
So this comes out of sort of a continents matter literature, really. And they're actually classified by, at least in, OK. Some of these are classified. The more general dimensions, this can be more complicated. But uh, the ones that will be interested, in, they're classified by group cohomology. In our case, this will be some omega and h2 of g0, comma u1. And I'll explain very quickly to give you an intuition why this is sort of an intuition, why, why this could be correct. And actually, if you are someone who's worked with string orbifolds, omega really is something like discrete torsion. In, in orbifold constructions and string theory, if this is helpful. So one way of thinking about it is, is we've seen we have sort of, we're starting with a G-symmetric theory. So we have some lines, say, that are actually the, these G and H and GH type lines. And we're trying to actually ask, what kind of objects could we attach here? Some phases, omega GH, sort of, right before we were just saying there's some kind of composition of these group elements and it's just g times h. But now when I say actually I can attach a phase here, so some omega in u1. So what are they allowed? Such phases. And they of course need to be consistent with things that we also looked at, um, like these sort of diagrams. If I do G H K and G H K into G H K, right? It needs to be consistent with these, and I'm sort of decorating these with omegas. And now you can see there'll be a non-trivial consistency condition on these omegas because they'll basically say omega G H first times omega, and now here I've, I'm coming in with gh, right? So this is like omega gh comma k. That needs to be the same as first hk. Okay, so I'm, okay. And then omega, now here we have hk, and so this is ghk. So this sort of identity actually says, that this, this is sort of saying, in some sense, this is the delta omega, and this sort of cohomological sense is zero. So it's in this sort of cohomology. It's a U1-valued map from G to G, right? So omega is a map from G to G, G times G into U1, sorry. And it satisfies these conditions, and that's precisely this sort of thing, OK? And there's more to the story, um, but that's what we'll need for the, for the moment. So these type of sort of trivial T, Q of Ts, right? They, they, they really are just characterized by the fact that they, they have this symmetry. Um, they will be the things that we can now attach here if you're preserving the full G symmetry. So I'll now tell you what actually is sort of the set of T, Q of Ts that we can attach. So the 2D T, Q of Ts, basically there are two sort of sets of things we can do. We can say either they preserve G uh, completely, and then there is one vacuum, and there's one vacuum basically for each choice of these omegas, for each H2. element, but we all know if you have a symmetry and you have such a, a two-dimensional uh, theory, you can also now look at vacuum that actually breaks symmetry. So you can have a G is broken spontaneously to H, which is a subgroup. There's spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, 
And then also, when you do that, you break to a subgroup, and uh, there's a multiplicity. So now there's a G mod H, many vacua. But again, once we have an H, we can also turn on an H SPT phase. So in fact, what we have is G mod H vacua with SPT phase for H, i.e. an element in H2, let's call it uh, omega H. And that actually gives you all the two DTQFTs. And so, lo and behold, what we find is these two DTQFTs. These two DTQFTs are basically labeled by some H and some alpha H. And H is basically any subgroup, including the group itself, any subgroup, uh, subgroup of G. So these are the 2D TQFTs. These are the 2D G TQFTs that we can use to play this game of these theta defectors. And Good now the question, question is, when we have these what is actually now their fusion? And I have then, a question. Yes, sorry. yes. Um, so when you say that there are the um, G mod H vacua, mm -hmm. do you mean that the number of vacua is the order of that quotient? That's right, yes. Or, uh, because in the previous case in one dimensions, we had generic irreducible representations of G. Yes. So the number of vacua is not necessarily as many as the order of, no, of the group. Not. But here so it is different. Here basic, yes, so here the multiplicity is really given in terms of the, this uh, coset. So we'll, we'll do an example. It, it's that, that determines the multiplicity of the. So you, you essentially have symmetry breaking, and in each vacuum you have an H symmetry, but you have G mod H many such vacuum. So suppose that G is completely broken. Why can't I have a generic representation of G? Ah, but we, I haven't said anything about representation yet. I haven't told you anything about representation. This is literally this is my just question, where the number of vacua is fixed uh, and uh, I can, th they cannot form a more generic representation. Um, oh, you mean on top of this? Yes, because in the one dimensional case yeah, where we had G yes. and we said the number of vacua is the dimension of a generic representation right. of G. So you're saying each one of these things could form something more complicated. Yeah, that's my question. Um, that's a good question. Let me think about it. Um, right, because here, it was essentially just, the, everything was just determined in terms of the decomposition into representations, right? And here, I think it's really a statement about in each one of these, so for example, you could have asked, is there also maybe a choice of different SPT phase? But that actually can, because actually this group G mod H still acts on these. So, um, you will find in the actual line, of, so in, in this, what we're constructing here are these surfaces, there is actually a, a representation decomposition secretly in this, which is in the lines. So this is actually happening again on the, on the level of the lines. So maybe this is, or it's hidden. Okay, let me, let me think about the question. Thanks. Okay, so we're saying our TQTs are basically from H, from omega H, and I would like to know what is the, the fusion of two such T. So actually, what I will do is I will restrict. Okay. Okay, I, I don't know. Okay, yeah. I will restrict in this for the moment, in fact, completely to G abelian. In fact, you can do this also more generally, and I think then when you're, what you're saying is completely correct, you could do something more complicated. But even what we'll see is in the G abelian case, there is now also some non-invertible structure. So G zero abelian. Because otherwise we'll get into a little bit of 
more complicated structure, and this is your point. Okay, so G abelian, so for example, think about it as just a cyclic group, and we'll do Z2 or Z4, these type of examples. So essentially, what the, what the, the in this case, so I'm gonna put it up here on the right, tensor now TK, omega K, right, so H and K are both subgroups of G, and there are these co-cycles potentially attached. So this actually gives just some multiplicity, that's T, H intersected K, comma, omega H intersected K. So let me unpack this and explain to you what is actually this multiplicity. And if this multiplicity isn't one, then that also is already a non-invertible structure. Right, because this is not a fusion that you could then easily invert or invert at all. Okay, so each of these TQFTs, I think I can think of essentially as, uh, right, we said there's a bunch of vacua, the vacua, V1, V, uh, G mod H, and we want to take the tensor product with K, um, omega, omega K, and the vacuum here I say W1, WG mod K, order. And so now what you'll get is, in the decomposition, this will essentially mean the vacuum over here are just gonna be something again like VIWJ. And what is actually the symmetry in these vacua, the symmetry that's unbroken is going to be exactly H intersected K. Right, so you have in one set of vacua H and the other K, and now you'd like to know in this combined set actually what's preserved is this subgroup H, mod K, H intersected K, so in fact, we get H intersected K, and then there's a story with the co-cycle that actually goes along to the right. But now the question is, what is actually this multiplicity, right? So here. So we get these type of vacua, and now what we have is a symmetry that's unbroken, that's H intersected K. So we start with G, and in these vacua we have an H intersected K subgroup. So now we have, of course, a decomposition into H intersected K. So in fact, this number here will be simply sort of a reduction of how many of these you had, how many of these you had modulo the action of this group. So this number here, H intersected K, right, we decompose now all these vacua into orbits of this new subgroup, and that's this quotient G mod H times G mod K. That's just the total number of vacua, but then we have to mod out by the group that we're now using the orbiting into, and that's H intersected K and G mod, of course. Yeah, does this make sense? So this is now a non-trivial multiplicity potentially, and if this is unequal to one, this is definitely a non-invertible fusion. So our story was, these are now the TQFTs. They fuse in this way. Now we actually put them into our 3D theory. We gauge, and we should be getting something non-invertible as a topological defect in these theories. So now we, we basically do the map a, H omega H. This becomes now defect. In this case, this was a two-dimensional defect, so D2. And now actually, it's a little bit more convenient to label it by the coset, comma omega H, right? And these are now topological to surface defects. in 
this theory mod d0, right? And this theory here, and this 3D theory. So this is what we get over here. So I want to make an example because you might say, whoa, by now you're talking again about abelian groups. Are you sure this is actually going to give something non-invertible? And it does. So are there any questions about the general sort of story? Example. Yeah, Christian. So it, it is important that the co-cycle is non-trivial. Like I think when the co-cycle is non-trivial, it's projected representations. Yes, not so this, it's more uh, complicated, yes. So in fact, if I were to do the Z2 times Z2 example, which is the first that has actually a non-trivial co-cycle, this whole thing becomes a very, very complicated category. Okay. And you can look it up in the appendix of this paper. And it, it's a very rich structure already. And I'll restrict myself to Z2, but you already see in Z2, this is quite interesting. Okay, thanks. But you're right, with the co-cycle, there are more choices to get more defects. And you need also then track that this, I didn't really tell you what this is, but there's a little bit of a story how you actually construct this co-cycle uh, from the ones you have over there. Okay, but let's you know, first look at the simplest example. Are there any other questions? Okay, I'll prepare this example. So what are the subgroups of Z2? Okay, and this will sound very trivial because it's, you know, it's not particularly, so there's the trivial subgroup, let's call it one. So this trivial subgroup. Well, and then, it's a simple group, so there's Z2. So these are the two subgroups. And in, the, in this case, H2 of Z2, U1, is actually zero. And this is a comment I just made to Christian, is basically, if you want a non-trivial cycle, if you want uh, omega non-zero, look at the Z2 times Z2. That's the first. Sorry, it cannot be pleasant to listen to. Okay. Right. It's because I'm too short for this stream. Okay. Um, so this is a reasonable starting point. Right? We have a relatively simple setup. Um, now what we have is essentially, so this is the case where the symmetry is so where H is sort of fully, uh, G is fully preserved, and this is where it's completely broken. Um, so let's look at the case H is equal to one. So in this case, actually Z2 is the, the simple case, right? So this is like one vacuum, and G is unbroken. And I wanna call this vacuum zero. And let's call this defect accordingly d to it. It is right, so this is so this is basically g mod h is like one, and that's why I'm calling it the identity. So h is equal to one. So z2 is completely broken. So this contains the symmetry breaking completely to nothing. So in this case, what we have is um, there are two vacua. Um, right, and then sort of the G mod H is two, and I wanna call them plus and minus. And now what we have to do is, well, okay, in the defect uh, associated to this, I wanna call D2, Z2, right? So Z H, this is just that G mod H is now Z2. And now we would like to calculate the fusion of these two defects. to it with itself, well, that's one vacuum, or one vacuum, the unbroken subgroup is the intersection of Z2 with itself, it's Z2, that's again Z2. 
that's an easy one. D2 is with D2, D2, right? So now we have here, this is one vacuum. We have here the two plus minus vacua. So we have here H is Z2 and here H is trivial. So the intersection of these is trivial. So this is gonna be D2, Z2, right? Because in this case, H intersect with K is just, again, uh, trivial. But the question is, what's the multiplicity? So we get two vacua, right? Zero tensor with zero tensor one, a plus plus zero minus, but the group acts as one orbit, so we get just one. And now we also have, so far these look completely boring, these fusions, right? This all is super, super nice and very invertible looking. And now the question is what is D2Z2 with D2Z2? Remember this is the one, right, where H is equal to trivial, uh, K is equal to one, so actually H intersected K is gonna be one as well. So we get D2Z2. Um, but now we have got here, say, plus minus, and also plus minus. And now what we get here is if you de decompose into these orbits, we get plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, in terms of the vacua. And now, of course, the Z2, the two orbits of these, and we can also just stick it in this formula, but uh, this is uh, two, right? So you get two orbits, and they are telling us there's a two. So this is our first truly derived non-invertible fusion in a non-two-dimensional theory. So some of you will notice and will say, well, I've seen this before, um, and actually this is, not a coincidence, but let me just pause for a question at this point about this example. Yep. So very uh, quick question. Um, so the fusion rules you wrote uh, are all abelian in a sense. Uh, does this depend on the group being abelian or uh, hmm? it's... Uh, does this depend on the group being a billion or is just a no. structure that is from, you know, so the intersections, fact, the, et cetera? The, yeah, so here these are all a billion things, but uh, for uh, could I mention one defect that can be non-abelian, this type of, you know, what are called triality defects, condensation defects. But here these are all a billion because everything is just determined in terms of the vacuum. So a billion in the sense of the, the order doesn't matter. I mean, here the order doesn't matter anyway, but. Okay, we have so, a question. Yeah. Um, forget for the technical question, but yeah. is, is this the higher gauging on the one from yeah, symmetry? Yeah, so that's what I'm going to say, exactly. So uh, Francesco was just saying, is this the higher gauging? Indeed, these are exactly the condensation defects. So um, uh, these are these D2, D2 are also constructible by gauging a higher form symmetry, a one form symmetry in this case, a one form symmetry on a subspace. In a two dimensional subspace, is this still working? So this is what's called condensation defect. And that's sort of what's been discussed in this paper here and introduced in this paper. And I wanna explain a little bit how that all fits together. 
So we started with a theory that had a zero form symmetry, we gauged it, and then we get these topological defects. Now, what actually we have is a little bit more than that. So we started with a 3D theory, T, with G0 is equal to Z2. And then someone should have at that point said to me, wow, hold on, you told us in the first lecture it's a BLEN, there's a dual symmetry. So in T mod G0, we have the dual symmetry, uh, the dual to a zero form symmetry in three dimensions is a one form symmetry. So we have a dual one form symmetry as well, right? So this is Z2 one form. And Z2, this Z2 one form is generated by topological lines, D1G, um, okay, well, D1 minus, let's call it, with D1 minus with itself is the identity line. Right? These are lines, topological lines that generate a one form symmetry that's Z2. So if we now actually take stock, so what, what is actually, what is the full symmetry of the theory T mod Z2? I don't want to do this here at the bottom. I want to do this over here. This is now a collection of different things, right? We, we constructed these Z2, Z2, this, these surfaces. We also have these topological lines. And so this whole thing comprises the full collection of objects that we should call a symmetry. So this T mod Z2, uh, zero, has, it has surfaces and symmetry. It has surfaces it also has uh, lines this has this is completely invertible right this is this is just group like but these here have these non invertible fusion and now the question is and then, then also secret you have points. Uh, that's the, the, you could think of like point-like things on these lines, but they're actually not that interesting in this case at the moment. So what you actually have is this collection of things, and this is now new because in two dimensions, we really had only lines and junctions, so points. Now we have surfaces, lines, and then these points. This is actually f the full structure. So mathematically, um, Okay, so, so let me answer two things. The first question is, how does this fit with this sort of statement? And the statement is, these surfaces, so in fact, these Z2, Z2, we can think of as, we take the trivial surface and we gauge uh, the Z2 one form, Right, so this, these are the lines, this is the one form symmetry. These are the zero form on, um, on it. And this is also known as the condensation surface on some M2 or the Z21. So this is the connection between condensation surfaces and these theta defects. So these theta defects give you the condensation surfaces for the dual one-form symmetry. Okay, so the theta defects here are the condensation defects for the dual one form symmetry. Okay. 
that's the first comment. Um, the other comment is, now if you are a mathematician, and you know, in all of these we have fusions, right? In addition, you have all of these have a fusion structure. So some composition of these topological defects. And what this structure actually is, is something that people would call a two fusion category. And here it is again. And so the two refers to the fact that we don't just have one layer of lines and then some points. The points are like, um, you know, things that sit between two lines. We actually have surfaces between two surfaces that can be lines and between two lines that can be points. So it's this sort of three-layered structure. So we have surfaces, lines, and points. And these are what they would call objects in your category. These are morphisms, or one morphisms. And these are two morphisms. But really, this is just, in some way, this you could, for the moment, think of it as terminology, because um, all it describes is what we just derived in terms of a physics sort of picture. And so I might one picture that's maybe useful is so you can think of you have these D2, for example, D2, Z2, and then you can have topological lines. Actually, let's not specify what. So you have some kind of objects, let's label it by A. You can have two of these. And then there's a, li a topological line here, D1, AB. A1, A, A, B prime, and then here there's a D0 that is a junction between these two topological lines. And I think maybe this is the moment when the color is coming in handy. So you have these here, and you have a line here, and So the, in particular, um, this specific thing we constructed is a, in particular, uh, the <clears throat> when we started the three-dimensional theory, T with G0, remember in two dimensions, I just said this, let's call this here VEC G. It's, vector spaces graded by G. These are just topological lines labeled by G with G group fusions. So in three dimensions, in analogy, these are actually these D2 G surfaces, right, that we started with that were completely invertible. And they're lines, and they're actually they're lines, D1, G, and points. They form also now a two category, and this is the two category two vec G, right? So we saw with G, vec G in one dimension, in two, in two dimensions, in three dimensions, we have two vec G. Now when we gauge this, and not surprisingly, we get this T mod G theory, and here we have these D2, D2, um, D2 id, and D1 id, D1 minus, and then some points. This object here is called 2 rep G. And indeed, you see that, in fact, this th the, the lines here form exactly the representation, the one rep. And so if this were non-abelian, you would also get non-abelian lines here, and that's exactly how you would see that there's more to this, this structure. So this is just the label for what we just constructed. Okay. Yep. 
Um, okay, the fact that these theta defects coincide with the condensation defect uh, is the most general situation. I mean, in, in generic dimension, uh, if, uh, it's not no. true. So I will do an example probably this afternoon where this stacking with TQ of T will give you not a condensation defect. No, okay, I, I, I see that you can get uh, all condensation defects uh, all plus uh, stacking of uh, the couple TGFTs. Uh. No, because, you can get also, uh. because, so here we are in two dimensions, the 2D TQFTs, here you get, this is what you get. And this is, you can always think of it as condensation. But when we actually don't go to four dimensions, which is obviously interesting for various reasons, you can stack with 3D TQFTs. Now, when you have 3D TQFTs, you can have non-trivial topological order. So it's not just labeled by, not, you know, well, basically a bunch of vacua and some representation theory on these, these vacua decomposition. But you can have genuinely not interesting 3D TQFTs with G symmetry that you can attach and gauge. And in that way, and I'll do the example. So for example, if you have a mixed anomaly, you cannot even just stack something that is sort of trivial like these, these, these uh, sort of 3D TQFTs which are just labeled by uh, co-cycles. You actually need to stack something to cancel anomaly. So that's actually a one chern simon theory, for example, in three dimensions. And then the associated defects are not condensation types. It's actually in a different frame, the duality defects. But is it still true that uh, in the TQFT that you put, uh, the G symmetry must be non-anomalous uh, in the full, in the full if, TGFT, right? Well, it must be non-anomalous in the sense if the theory you start with is non-anomalous, then yes. Okay. But in the case, right, when you have an an anomalous transformation in the theory before you gauge, uh, okay, right? so. I will do this example. You will see that you actually need to cancel the anomaly first and then you use the, the 3D TQFT to stack it on top, cancel the anomaly, so then you can gauge. So the, the bulk is working like an inflow for that's the right. TQFT. Yeah. Okay, but that's going ahead. Um, we have another very question. Quickly. Yes. Uh, sorry. Yes, yes, when I we can. gauge uh, discrete symmetries, usually we get also the magnetic symmetry on top of the electric one, which yes. is I think the lines that you constructed. Uh, Are you, able you mean to this, this, the dual symmetry? There is the dual symmetry and also the magnetic one usually. Like if, if I gauge a Z2 symmetry, I get two, two Z2s after the gauging. Uh, one is uh, generated by the Wilson lines mm. and the other by the... Yeah, but then they are, they are not genuine, right? Well, yeah. I mean, they have stuff attached to them. So I really here I'm talking about symmetry generators, the topological defects that are genuine operators. For example, if I gauge a Z2 symmetry in a trivial theory, I get a Z2 gauge theory, which has two, two symmetries, no? One, a Z2 electric and a Z2 ma magnetic. Then, okay, if I add matter, maybe some, some symmetry can be broken, but generically, I think... Uh, yes? Bo both two, no? Okay. But do you agree that in this case, when it start with a zero form symmetry, right? Maybe the way I can answer this question is to write down the the, the right. There's in this theory there's a, about 40 TQFT, the the sim TFT that has this is a, it's about 40 theory that has basically B two delta C one. And all I'm doing is I'm imposing different boundary conditions on that. So I'm, I, there's no room for an extra Z2, right? I mean, I started with something that was generated by flat, by, by C1, so C1 was the, the map background for the zero form, and then I actually changed the boundary condition to B2 being the background, that's the one form symmetry, so that's this here. And maybe we can discuss, uh, I don't know if you have to answer the question or not. Okay, so this was a very abstract, Analysis, I want to tell you now examples of actual 3D quantum field theories where these gadgets are appearing in real life. And they're not complicated theories at all. In fact, they're surprisingly simple. So what are actually examples? 
of 3D QF keys with such a tool wrap, the tool or tool wrap G or generally symmetry. Um, so the, for Z2, the G equals to Z2, we can start with a zero form symmetry. And in fact, uh, the, if you have the gauge group, so I just take pure G gauge is equal to SO3, and then I'll go to G gauge is equal to SU2. Um, Young Mills. And it's not that this is the most interesting three-dimensional theory to look at, but it gives you an idea of what actually the type of theories are where you would see these things. And then four dimensions, there'll be interesting, actually, theories that I'll discuss. Too. So these are pure gauge theories. This one has a Z2-0 form symmetry. Um, so this is, has a two-vec uh, Z2 symmetry. And when I gauge, I get a Z2-1. And all these condensation defects also. And this is the two rep Z2. Right, and one way of seeing this is this SU2 has a one form symmetry. It's just a center. This is just a center symmetry. And from the center symmetry, I know these I can construct either by condensation or well, I can think of them as coming from the SO3, where the, this one form actually becomes a zero form in three dimensions. Right? This is just the, the analog of the magnetic one form symmetry in, in, in 40, where there was a one form symmetry here, it's a zero form symmetry, the dual. And I can take that, gauge it, and then these are the theta defects. Right? So you can think of these as the condensation defects. Or theta defects. And of course, you can extend this to other things. So in, for example, um, more complicated examples, which have also symmetries that are a little bit more interesting. So for n equals to, so if you do a SUN, um, you have a VN um, one form symmetry. And so actually, what the full category is, is actually two rep of VN. This is the symmetry. And so now you have these, these um, defects. Here we construct the Z2, but you can repeat this for Zn. Um, and then you get, again, non-invertible defects for that. It's also an example if you have actually n equals to 3, so SU3. This is a bit more interesting because in this case, there is more structure because you also have um, uh, not just this, but you also have a Z2 outer automorphism. Zero form symmetry, and you can combine this, and then you can get actually something like rep S3. So that's a more com that has topological lines that actually are forming a representation of S3. So these are examples of. QFTs that actually um, have these sort of condensation or theta defects as symmetries. But that's just one class of these type of things. And actually, it's, it's interesting to ask, are there actually also um, non-invertible symmetries in, in QFTs that are not of this type, not of this condensation type? When do I actually have to finish? 20 in 20 minutes. So do you have questions about these 3D examples? Because I will now discuss in a bit more detail an example that isn't quite of this type, where you get non-invertible symmetries more from this sort of perspective of um, uh, the, um, the gauging of the outer automobile, actually. I'm thinking 
Okay. I will discuss this example that, uh, that may actually fit in better, and then I'll do this other thing later. So in fact, let's continue along this, this line of reasoning. So we had these theta defects, and so now actually, let's go to D equals to four, right? So we do care about four-dimensional quantum field theories. Um, now, what we can do here is, right, the, 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 the mantra was take this and now stack it with a 3D GTQFT, um, or something more than that, like a 4D theory, and gauge this. And that we can perfectly well do. Uh, the issue is just, so 3D TQFTs are um, more complicated. That's sort of an understatement, but... Um, Right? So there's still, there exists still these uh, analogs of SPT phases for so G SPTs, and they're again sort of in omega, now in H3, G, U1. But they're also, they're genuinely non trivial. Um, 3D TQFTs. And so these are going in the name of 3D topological order. And a lot of Collins matter theory is about you know, understanding these better and maybe measuring them in the lab. And so then they're characterized by categories themselves, and these are these so-called modular tensor categories. So in principle, when we do this theta defect construction, we're not limited to taking just these type of SPT phase TQFTs, but we could also be stacking something more non-trivial. And in fact, sometimes we need to um, stack with, with TQFTs that have even non-topological boundary conditions. So if this is obscure, I'll explain a moment what this is, non-topological boundary conditions. So for example, uh, Trans Simons theory for some group G with some level K, and the boundary, if I put them on some space M3, where the boundary of M3 is sigma 2, we all know that this gives actually a chiral CFT, that's a CFT 2, WGW at level K, for example. So sometimes you actually even need to do this, and so there's obviously something non trivial living even on these boundaries of such theories. And that's very different from these type of SPTs that are relatively trivial in comparison. And I'll give you an example that's an interesting physics example that also illustrates that there's a much richer structure in terms of what we can use in terms of constructing theta defects, um, or what we call twisted theta defects, because these are, I mean, we call these things, this will give rise to theta defects theta or condensations. And all of this here, if you stack with that, are called twisted theta defects. And it's the same principle. We take the TQFT, we gauge this G, and then the TQFT becomes a defect in the gauge theory. Um, and so actually, most constructions of non-invertibles actually f that arise from some sort of gauging uh, fit into this framework. That's why it's nice to organize it in this way, rather than sort of discuss different constructions uh, successively using different tools. So the example I want to discuss um, is uh, the example is 
because when I was first discussed by Heidi, Mori, and Zing, and this one of the two first papers, um, where you can also this was this other paper, the duality defect paper, but this construction here ties in exactly to these types of stackings with CT of T. And it's and I apply it to to 40 n equals to one super young mills. Um, well, same way as S U two gauge group or uh, gauge algebra S U two. And that's a theory we should all care about because it has, right, so it's known that the SU2 group theory, that actually has very interest, there's confinement in the IR and a uh, very interesting vacuum structure. Um, so <clears throat> what actually characterizes this theory, um, actually let's start with the, the group SU2. Uh, this theory is, it's supersymmetric, but only relevant for the following fact. So 40n equals to one supersymmetry implies that you have a U1R symmetry, but this in this case gets broken um, to by anomaly to the Z, Z2N zero form symmetry. So this is a zero form symmetry in this theory. Um, and it also has a center. So actually I'm doing it for N, so let's do it for SUN for a moment. So, <clears throat> and it has also a one form symmetry that's actually quite crucial for the confinement, uh, which is the end. And these two symmetries are global symmetries. Uh, it also has a gauge symmetry, but we don't worry about that too much. And these have also a mixed anomaly. Mixed half anomaly. So when we have a one form symmetry, there's a background field E2. A zero form symmetry, there's a background field A1. And this mixed anomaly will have the following form. In some A5, there's E to the N A1 E2 squared. All right, so this lives in some five dimensional space where the four-dimensional young Mills theory lives on its boundary. Anyway, so this is the anomaly. And what we want to do is the goal is gauge the one-form symmetry and go to the PSU N theory. And the question is, what is the symmetry of that PSU N theory? Just as a quick recap for the for the SUN, this one form symmetry will persist with this mixed anomaly to the IR, and that will confine and will have N vacua, right? So the Z2N will break to basically Z2, and then there are N vacua, and uh, they're all confining. And the question is what actually happens when you go to PSUN? So the first observation is if you gauge this, it shouldn't be a problem to gauge the one-form symmetry because it's not that it's a one-form symmetry only anomaly. It's a mixed anomaly. But there is a problem with this particular setup because if you look at the zero-form symmetry generator, this is some topological co-dimension one defect. Let's say one, the generator for this one, on some three-manifold. If we actually do background gauge transformation in these background gauge fields, and we shift this A1, actually this picks up. So background gauge transformations. Then what happens is actually, because A1 goes to delta lambda, this, however, is non-trivial. This actually picks up a particular term, so this goes to D3 um, with an extra phase, which is minus 2 pi i over n, 
e to the square. And now m, this is over an m4, and this is sort of m3 with an m4 attached. And that's not good. So that you can't just gauge the symmetry. So there's, from the perspective of the zero form symmetry generator, there is some anomaly. There's an anomalous background gauge transformation. So um, when you actually now gauge the one form symmetry, this will not be a healthy defect anymore. So what we need to do is, um, before we gauge, we actually need to cure this transformation, this anomalous transformation of the defect. And well, we just learned we can, before we gauge, stack TQFTs. And so now the question is, can we can cure this? by stacking a CD TQFT um, such that cancels has the same properties, has a one form symmetry and an anomaly. which is basically this uh, 2 pi over n, these two squared anomaly. Right? I told you there are in three dimensions for the one form symmetry there are these v2 squared anomalies. So I can stack something that has precisely these properties, a 3D T QFT on top and then gauge, because then this uh, variation just will cancel out. And in fact, in a very nice paper, um, Sin, Lam, and Cyberg, essentially in 2018, classified what are the minimal TQFTs in three dimensions that have a certain one form symmetry anomaly and a certain, a one form symmetry and a certain anomaly. So they classified so the minimal 3D TQFTs with one form symmetry and a given anomaly. one form symmetry Zn, say, an anomaly P, so P times V2 squared, and they call them APN, and for all purposes, we just need the An comma ones, so they're called An comma P, so for N, Zn one form symmetry, and P is the, the anomaly that you have, and so what we need is, we need For this defect that generates this one for zero form symmetry, we need the an comma one. And in fact, they also showed the fusion of these, right? We also always need the fusion of these TQFTs. These fusions are actually very simple. So one an comma one is a n comma two, an comma two when n is prime. And please don't ask me what it is for n not prime. <laughs> so let's stick to n equals to two. That for all purposes is a prime number. And now we can ask for SU2, what actually do we get now? So we take the defect D3, one, and we just replace it um, with a defect, let's call it curly D3, one on the same three manifold, which is just D31 times this A2 comma 1. For, for SUN, you would stack it with SUN comma 1. And this object now has precisely, and I should have said that is a, here there is a minus, so it has, should have precisely the opposite anomaly. Right? And so this actually cancels precisely this anomaly. So this has no anomalous transformation. And now we are ready to gauge. 
right? So now we stack this with the TQT. And now we know from our general sort of understanding, well, this should now become a topological defect in the gauge theory. So when we gauge uh, the Vn1, V21 form symmetry, what we get is now a new defect. This is now one defect in the new theory. And so this V31 and 3 is now a zero form symmetry defect. And the question is, what is its fusion? And because we have the fusion of these guys, right, now we have two of these, we get exactly that here. We can actually rewrite this, the fusion of M3 is actually So you can actually write it down for the n case if you want. Uh, uh, if your n is prime, uh, maybe you would like to form n. Uh, d3, 1, d3, 2, and 3. And there's another fusion. So now here you see this here is a TQFT that appears as a coefficient in this fusion. And then there's the fusion of the defect with its uh, conjugate, so when we stack with sort of the, the, the A dagger, T, Q, F, T, so D3 um, and 3 with D3 dagger, and this actually turns out to be the condensation defect uh, on M3 of the dual one form symmetry. This is the condensation Okay, so we get in the PSUN or the SO3 for the N equals two case, now these zero form symmetry generators that have these non-invertible fusions. So the more generally the PSUN pure N equals to one super young null theory in 40 has sort of non-condensation. So these are Right, these are twisted thetas, they are really, these TQFTs, right, these are, oh, okay. Um, no one asked me what the hell is the theory. Um, this is actually very simple. In this case, it's just a U1 level N churn Simons theory. So that's why you can then do all these calculations and determine it. So here we actually have a theory that precisely fits into this framework. We have a churn Simons theory and a, the, its boundary is not a gap theory, it's actually a two-dimensional to Carol goes on. Okay. So, I'm finishing in two minutes. This one has non-invertible. Symmetry, which is basically either coming from this perspective of this anomaly, and these are basically sort of what you could call these twisted thetas. Right, the non-invertibility, again, comes from the fact that we had to attach, or we were attaching these 3 d TQFTs to this zero-form symmetry generator, and then gauged. So this is sort of the theme that goes through out all these constructions, that there is some sort of uh, non-invertibility that comes because of the, um, the structure of these TQFTs that fuse in this sort of peculiar fashion. Okay. Are there any questions? One minute for questions. Yep. This is now ex the example that I was referring to when you asked earlier. Okay, but if I'm understanding correctly, this construction of a twisted theta defect is not really as the theta defect. I mean, in the you just put a TGFT and you gauge. 
Here uh, you are taking active T, which is anomalous. So if you gauge, uh, you have to attack an SPT, but you are using another defect of the theory, which uh, has an, an SPT attached and you are fusing yeah. together. So here the idea is sometimes you can gauge without actually attaching a TQFT that has some anomalous variation, right? Because here this was really the key thing. About yeah, okay, it's, it's the same thing because you're, at, you're attaching the other defect, the other zero form symmetry of the theory, which also have a, a, an, yeah. a, an so inflow together, attached and they cancel together. That's right. So here it's not an option. I mean, it's not an option either in the, in the early case. Here basically this forces you before you gauge to actually attach this TQFT so that you then get a consistent uh, zero form symmetry generator for that dual theory. So, but it still follows sort of, in, it, it's, there are also examples, of course, you can write down things like, you know, just um, sort of simplified versions of three rep Z2, for example. And that there you would just attach SPTs. But the point is, when you go to four dimensions, there are more TQFTs. And in fact, you can even, if it's non anomalous, you can also actually attach a 3D, say an MTC with a Z2 symmetry, for example, and then gauge. So this category 3 rep G is much, much richer than what you would get from just looking at these things. And indeed, sometimes in physical situations, you can have sort of additional peculiar things that you have to attach TQFTs which don't have these gap boundary conditions. Uh, sorry, also, also another question. Uh, even in, in the case in which the TQFT is non-anomalous, uh, you, you can also have a situation in which, le, le, uh, let's do an example, for example, uh, you, you want level K times N square. If K and N are not prime, you can gauge the subgroup ZN. Yeah. Um, in this case, do you get a condensation defect or not? So what you want to do U1? U1 level K N square. Okay, this is your theory? The, the, no, this is the TQFT that I want to attach. Okay. Uh, in a 4D in a theory, mm -hmm. which has a ZN1 from symmetry. Yeah. Because in this case, uh, um, I mean, if you, if you take this theory, the, the, uh, this is not a pure gauge theory. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and there is a non-trivial extension of uh, ZN times uh, KN, uh, ZKN. So I'm not sure whether you get, uh, if you, if, if you do the data construction for so ZN, if you get. Theory, you have a 4D theory where you have a Z, you were saying Z2? Uh, a, a ZN one from symmetry. ZN one form? Yep. And do you want to use the and subgroup non -anomalous ZN? anomalous or anomalous? It's non anomalous. Okay. And you want to group, uh, use the subgroup ZN mm -hmm. of uh, ZKN square of the TGFT through the data construction. But this here is not a, just an SPT phase, right? No, it's not it's an not. SPT. So it's more, it's a definitely a twisted theta construction. Okay. Right. Because this will have an anomaly um, of the type A, K, N squared, comma one. Yeah, but the subgroup I'm gauging is not anomalous. So. That's true, yes. Okay, you're saying you, you're sort of doing um, twisted slash, so a, a hybrid thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I have there are many different variations of this, and I don't think that has been explored yet. That's, that's an interesting case. I have a question, yeah. which is somehow a follow up on this. Um, so when we discuss two and three dimensions. Uh, the logic in this theta defect was, uh, so we gauge a symmetry, and now we classify all the TQFTs that have the given symmetry. But now in this example, you're saying, uh, uh, now in, in three dimensions, there are non-trivial TQFTs. So if I try to classify TQFTs with a given symmetry, it's an infinite number. So it looks like I can construct an infinite number yeah, of so uh, theta think, defects yeah, in, a, in a given... Yes, you can construct in this way, yeah. So there's still always this construction. And then there's a question, and I do actually have a T, so you need for a TQFT that has a G symmetry, right? 
it's not just any, I, I don't want to just attach anything. It, it should still, it can of course always attach a, a theory that has no G symmetry and then it's just a product, it stays a product. But I would like to have say um, uh, some MTC with some G symmetry, so it has some Z2 symmetry say. So the question is then how many are there and when I attach them, what do I actually get? Well, yes, because even with this condition, there is an infinite number of TQFTs with G symmetry. So it looks like I can generate in a given theory an infinite number of theta defects. But are, are, are they really there? There is an infinite number know. of, so, of well, symmetries? First, yes, no, the first question is indeed what actually, so there's no question that you can't do this construction. So then the question is when you have such a theory and you do attach this and you gauge and you have now all these different topological defects, what actually do they do in the gauge theory? Like how do they act on the actual physical degrees of freedom and how is it actually distinguished these different sort of, you know, if I attach one MTC or another one, how are these, these symmetries? So, but it, it, indeed in, in 4D this, this category becomes extremely huge. Um, I think here there's also a, maybe a comment in, in the similar sort of vein. Uh, I actually, right, this, the, the main point of this paper was to classify the minimal such 3D TQFTs. Of course, what all this is saying is um, these NP, comma, 1, they're basically minimal in the sense that if you have a TQFT with this one form symmetry and that anomaly, then you can always factor it into this times something else, some other A prime, that doesn't have the anomaly. So here even, you could say you're attaching an arbitrary sort of TQFT. Now this doesn't really talk to anything in that theory, so it's completely decoupled, right? But in principle, that also, you could say, well, why did you use the minimal one? And actually Pavel has a comment. I was just going to look for Pavel because he was in fact saying it's sometimes easier to actually also relate it to this restriction here to attach all up beyond. So actually, you probably want to have a comment about, yes, he has a question, and he, he's got this construction of these Q mod Z uh, symmetries where you actually take all abelian TQFTs and then you can compute all these fusions sort of in a closed way. Yeah, first kind of a comment is not quite clear how this factoring out is canonical of this non 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 part is second, yeah, in principle, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my comment is that if, if when you start fusing fusing them, you will go out of the of, of, of the class I agree. or just minimal TQFTs, a couple of yeah. Yes, so this is indeed, that's why here I was saying, let's restrict the prime, then you really just, you can write down the action for this U1 level N transcendence and just integrate out some diagonal field and then you see this fusion. In fact, if you just want to look at these AN comma P's and do this, uh, more generically, then actually you, you see that there's some issue and, and Pavel has written this very nice paper on this Q mod Z. But I still don't know what actually is now the, the resolution. Should we now attach all abelian TQFTs? Is this? Okay, so, so you need to speak in the microphone, otherwise I can't hear you. No one else can hear. So uh, the thing is that uh, the, the symmetry G, no? Uh, has to act faithfully. I mean, it can, it, if you- Which the, symmetry? The, the G, zero form symmetry, no? If you put any TQFT, will not act faithfully on the full TQFT, no? We'll, we'll leave some operators invariant, no? Mm -hmm. the, the, the idea of A and P is the same, is that- Oh, uh, you mean here, okay. Uh, the, because here, this, well, this is not a zero form symmetry, right? This is a one form symmetry anomaly. Yeah, exactly. Then some uh, lines are invariant, and the, the, yeah, uh, which so are living in the prime. Yeah, so this A prime, this factor, so, First point is that what Paul was saying, this decomposition is not actually canonical. And if you do this, you go out of this class for generic A and But you can work in the equivalence class. That, that's a well-defined object. Yes. So it's, uh, it's called the wit, wit uh, class. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, you, can, you can work there, and then it's well-defined. Yeah. And I think the point, uh, I mean, this is how, how we understand it, is that uh, if you kind of factor out or you choose a representative in which the symmetry acts faithfully, like in, in this case it's separating A and P. I don't know what is in general the way in which you choose that nice representative. Then you can do everything and uh, any data about the decoupled thing is undetectable from the bulk, so it's not physical. I mean, I don't know how to yeah. measure it, no? 
That's true, but um, it's yeah. What? Okay, so uh, actually, this is maybe the right moment to make the following comment. So I think this came this came up yesterday when when I think Chris was asking me. So when did this all happen? So this all of these developments basically, um, well, they sort of started with this paper mentioned yesterday by this uh, swampland people. Then this in in the in 2021. In the fall, this paper and also the Cordova, Omori, Choi, Lam, Sin paper came out. And so this is a very, very young field. And so some of these questions are not yet as, there are loads of examples, and one goal is to actually understand them in a slightly more systematic way, right? And one of these questions is, so can you actually put them into sort of one story that we have a description that sort of gives you mathematically, but also sort of a, on a more conceptual way, a description of all these non-invertible symmetries. And it's clear we don't have that yet in higher dimensions. And one reason is that these, these uh, what we get here are three categories, three fusion categories. They are very, very complicated objects. We don't really know the full structure of them. But exactly these sort of questions, right, will at some point hopefully tell us what are the things that we really should be sort of, you know, taking into account, what is physically relevant, right? Like what you're saying, this width class. We shouldn't be looking at each defect, but maybe some equivalence class of these things. But that's all really part of everyday research at this moment. But, yeah, that's, I think this was not clear to everybody. That's why I wanted to at some point say it, now it seemed a good moment. I think now we're really over time, no? Now we are already in the discussion session. Oh, we're session. in the discussion session, okay. <laughs> okay, but then I think people should also ask Asha.